Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar um, of the 2004-2005 academic year. My name is Ozzy Arroyo, and I'm a program officer with our statewide initiatives team at the College Success Foundation. Um, and yeah, thanks again for joining us. Today's topic is going to be on the Passport Student Support Funds utilization, um, and we'll have our presenter and panel discussion panel moderator will be um, Don. So I'll go ahead and pass it on to her and let herself let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I am absolutely thrilled, and it is my pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Dawn Cipriano McCafferty, and I serve as the Assistant Director of the Passport to Careers Program at the Washington Student Achievement Council. Um, I, I, am, I have the privilege of having worked with the Passport Program since it started way back in 2007. And I've watched this program grow and change and, and um, work through some of the some challenges and, you know, celebrate some successes. And um, yeah, I can't wait to dive in on some of this work. So we'll go ahead. Next slide. Before we get started, we'll go ahead and do a, a land acknowledgement with gratitude and respect. The Washington Passport Network acknowledges we work and live on the unceded ancestral lands and waters of the indigenous peoples who are still here today. And we also, um, I know we're all coming from different parts across the state, um, but just wanted to say that we are honored and grateful to be here today on the traditional lands of native tribes and give thanks to the legacy of the original people, their lives and their descendants. So we, before we jump in and, and ask some questions of our panelists, I, I, I kind of want to do some um, level settings so that we all have an understanding of what's going on. Um, there are currently 47 institutions that have agreed to provide support services to passport students um, on college campuses. As part of that, WASAC provides um, the institutions with funding to help cover the costs asso associated with those supports that are provided to the students. Um, each institution uh, has developed a plan and every campus operates uniquely to address the needs of their students and to navigate campus um, culture and some of the policies that they have. Um, I'm so happy to have the representatives that we do with us today. Um, some of these some of these people are 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 um, more experienced in their in their work, and some are newer to newer to their practices. Um, I just also wanted to say that we are our own best advocates in in this work. Um, we are we are our own teachers, our our own learners. And um, I encourage you to lean on each other as as a network, um, because sometimes we just we just you know if we're struggling with something, it's a it's a good time to reach out to the network and say like, hey, I'm struggling with this. How can I get through? Or, hey, guess what I did? This is something that was really successful, and I'm really proud of the work that I did. And it you know I was able to engage students. Um, know that that what you do is rich and. Um, and the information that you share with, with our network um, is very, very important and it can be very helpful. So like I said, share your successes, ask questions, um, talk about challenges, reach out. We, both WASAC staff and the College Success staff and our own network, um, we are um, your best resources. So reach out to us. So today I have four learning outcomes. And um, the first one is, is we wanna talk about the relationship between passport funding and financial aid policy. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and allow our panelists to introduce themselves as, as we move on to the next slides. But um, you'll see that we have a financial aid expert and, and campus designated support staff. The second thing is that we're gonna be talking about best practices in utilizing passport student support funds um, in this upcoming year and uh, talking about opportunities for partnerships or looking for um, resources for supplemental funding for the program. And then looking at strategic ways to continue supporting passport students. 
And before we meet our panelists for today, um, just a quick um, practice in asking questions for our presentation today. Um, so use the chat function to drop your questions and we will get to them at the end during our Q&A in, in the order that they're received. Um, we'll be monitoring questions throughout the presentation and there will be at least 10 minutes scheduled at the end for a Q&A. Um, and if there are questions submitted that we don't have time to get to today, um, we'll follow up and answer those via email. So yeah, we can go ahead um, to our next slide and meet our panelists. So I'll, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves um, and we can go ahead and go in order um, that they're listed here. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Alvin. I'm the Director of Learning Support at Spokane Falls Community College and am the designated support staff for our institution. Good morning, everybody, or I guess I should say afternoon. Uh, my name is Angie Hobbs. I am the Assistant Director of Scholarships at the University of Washington in the Financial Aid Office. Um, I work directly with our campus support staff in helping to support students um, from the financial perspective of things. What's up, y'all? My name is Priya Osborne, and I am the Director of Student Success, Equity, and Diversity at Spokane Community College, and I'm also the designated support staff for our Passport to Careers program. I just wanted to thank um, our team today and you all in attendance um, for uh, the opportunity to share all about how great our Passport to Careers program is and just to, uh, yeah, be in community with you all today. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Lexi Shar, I'm the Assistant Director for College Success Programs at WSU. Also wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm so excited to hear from the other panelists and um, get into some of the topics that we're going to cover. Um, I work with Passport um, as the lead DSS in Pullman. Um, and I also work with uh, Teacher Prep SSS, which is a trio program here on campus. Okay, we're going to kick it off talking about passport and financial aid. So, Angie, I'm going to go ahead and start with you, since you're our financial aid expert. Um, in your institution, what are the financial aid policies to award students with emergency funding and other types of financial assistance? Sure. Thank you, Don. Um, at the UW, we have a, an emergency aid application for students to complete if they're um, experiencing any type of financial difficulties or emergencies. Um, this is just a place for any student to go and apply for emergency assistance if needed. Um, and then from there, we identify, we kind of review the applications and identify what uh, maybe resources we have, um, maybe on or off campus resources. Um, we also, because not all students are going to maybe know about this application, um, we also train our staff to recognize if a student comes in and is talking about having an emergency situation, and they can also be referred that way as well. Um, we work a lot with campus partners, um, so we will hear from various um, advisors or um, programs on campus where they're working with students who are in emergency situations. So we do have a lot of ways to identify these students, which is really great. Um, we also have, as far as a um, financial aid policy goes, um, students who are experiencing a loss of income or some sort of change to their resources that were reported on the FAFSA or the WASFA, they can submit um, a change of income form to our office. We can then reevaluate to see if um, the financial strength of the student to help pay for school needs to be changed in any way and then potentially making them more eligible for grant funding. As some of you may know, um, there have been some significant changes to financial aid regulations um, due to the FAFSA Simplification Act. Part of these changes include emergency financial assistance that does not, it should not affect other need-based funding that the student is receiving. So basically what that means is if they do report that they're receiving or they're having an emergency situation and we have emergency funding that we're able to provide to them, um, we can basically do an offset to their budget so it doesn't affect any of their other need-based aid. Whereas previously, it would um, take up some of their um, like remaining financial need and potentially taking away from the ability to have um, need-based funding at a later date. 
And Angie, can I ask you a really quick follow-up question? Um, are you are you um, able to use some of your passport student support funds to help with those emergency funding or, or emergency expenses? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I work very closely with the Champions Program on campus. Um, they are the designated support staff that um, that work directly with our passport students, and so. If I happen to talk to them before they talk to them, which doesn't happen very often because they are just fantastic. Um, but if I happen to talk with them, then I can also connect and we can discuss potentially using some of those, um, the support funding. Perfect. Thank you. Did um, Lexi, Priya, or Kathy want to go ahead and answer that question as well? Yeah, I'll um, jump in and, and add just a little bit. Um, one of the, the really cool things that we try to pick on when we're talking about um, emergency aid is making sure that we're also connecting students to financial literacy services. I know there we might hit on this a couple of times throughout a few of the different questions that we're going to answer. Um, but at WSU, um, we, we try to um, incorporate that in a few different ways, including the uh, Money Matters learning platform that we have that's available to all students, staff, and faculty. Um, so making sure that as we're uh, processing those emergency funding requests, we're also helping students kind of set up for the next semester and the next cycle that might um, might need some of the same expenses. Um, so that's a pretty critical piece that we like to as well. Thank you. Um, Priya, do you want to talk about, let's, let's move to the next question. So um, what barriers are you experiencing in accessing passport funding to award students? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what comes to mind in terms of what I've seen so far as a barrier for passport youth uh, is specific to unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, I feel like because when it comes to unaccom un identifying unaccompanied homeless youth, that really is in financial aid's wheelhouse in terms of utilizing their professional judgment um, to say, yes, they do qualify underneath the, they do qualify for the Passport to Careers program. And so and that's what I've seen be a barrier so far, because to me, um, unaccompanied homeless homelessness is if you don't have stable housing, right? And so I'm like, okay, if I meet face-to-face -face with the student, I'm like, but I got to send you to financial aid first so that they can make that determination. Um, and I have just come across situations so far in my one year and some change um, being the DSS where a student who I thought would qualify for UHY actually didn't. Um, and so we couldn't even access the passport funding for that student. Kathy, did you wanna address the same question? Well, one of the, the barriers that I think that we experienced last year was at accessing um, the support funds for our passport students for the, those emergency funds. Um, so we had to work with our financial aid department to um, look at process for the, the awarding of those incentive funds. Um, but I think that we got the kinks to that worked out. And so we are able to, that was one of the barriers that we faced this last academic year. And I feel like we've already made some of those awards this year and that process is, is becoming more and more seamless and we are not fighting it like we were last year. So that's a bonus. And I, I, again, I, with the change of the simplification and being able to award these emergency funds without having to look at a student's unmet need is going to be a huge change and for the good, right? So um, yeah, the barrier that we were seeing, I think has been eliminated. Fantastic. And it, it also sounds like I mean, I'm listening to Angie, I'm listening to Kathy and Priya um, and, and Lexi and all of you, it does sound like that you have really good working relationships with the financial aid office or with with the designated support staff. And I, you know, um, from my perspective, I can I can clearly see that some of the strongest programs are those programs that have really good communication between um, financial aid and the designated support staff. So ni nicely Absolutely, done. Don. I just want to piggyback off of that and say it really is a collaborative team effort and it's collaborative between campus partners, but also our community partners as well. Um, I know we'll get to that later on in the in the 
panel, but I just wanted to say it is a team effort to really achieve student success and eliminate those equity gaps. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so does your institution have the capacity to help supplement the reduced passport scholarship to support college affordability? Um, as you know, those of uh, the passport awards were cut almost in half this year um, because we have a very large number of students that are showing up on college campuses and um, not sufficient funding to keep up with 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 the population that's showing up on campuses. Um, so does your institution have the capacity to help supplement the reduced passport scholarship? Um, and if not, what discussions have taken place to overcome this student barrier? Angie, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with you again on that question. Oh, absolutely, it really kind of coincides with what we've been talking about um, as far as having really good um, partnership with our campus partners. Um, uh, we're really fortunate at the UW to have a lot of emergency funding that's available to students. Um, the problem that I see or the barriers that we tend to find is that a lot of students don't really know that those resources are available. And also they maybe are afraid to ask. And so um, for some reason, it seems um, like financial aid is a really scary topic for a lot of students. So I think that that kind of deters them from wanting to come to our office. Um, but what I find is that they're very comfortable in going to speak with um, champions program and the designated support staff because they work very closely with these students and they build a really close relationship with these students. And so by having this um, really wonderful symbiotic relationship with champions and, and financial aid, we're really able to find these students that are struggling and be able to support them as much as possible and get them emergency funding or potentially um, it's, if it's campus resources, if it's a food pantry, if it's, you know, uh, maybe help with housing, um, you know, we all, we work together to just figure out what is going to be the best path for the student. And again, a lot of it is about building rapport with the students themselves so that they can feel like they can come to you if something is going on. I know, I know it can be very, very difficult um, to reach out or have students um, engage in, in what you're trying to do. And you're right, educating students on the funding and support that's available to them is one of the challenges that we have in the program. Um, Lexi, I, I know, so Colleen did post, post a question in our chat about the program that you mentioned for financial literacy. Could you um, share that again and then maybe address the question, the, the same question about um, supplementing passport college affordability? Definitely. Um, yeah, so the, the learning platform is called Coog Money Matters, and I um, can send that website later if, if folks are interested in taking a look at it. Um, it is essentially every topic um, related to money that, that is a self-guided um, experience. So it's, it's really helpful for students to, to start with the absolute basics all the way through retirement and credit cards and what's a mortgage and um, all of those things. Uh, so it's um, a great resource. Um, I'll definitely make sure that that, that can get sent out later. Um, and then kind of coming back to the question, um, I just also want to shout out uh, WSU's Student Financial Services. Our team is absolutely awesome. Um, Misty Lewis, who's our FAA on campus, is a rock star. And uh, we just, she's gone above and beyond in helping identify students who are eligible for passport and making sure that um, we're connected with them. She actually comes to our office and does drop-in hours for folks, um, not just for the passport program, but for the others that are in the Office of Academic Engagement. Um, and this year, SFS was able to um, allocate $1,000 for passport students. Um, to kind of offset that that cost. I, my understanding is that's a, a one-time use of those funds, but it was super helpful for people who, um, you know, were uh, missing a significant chunk of what they were expecting um, as change happens. Um, but yeah, those partnerships with, with SFS or other places on campus are absolutely critical in, in supporting students. Um, and it's, it's so helpful to know even to just that, um, I think often it feels like it might be difficult for you to connect with every student just because everyone comes from a different, you know, in a different situation, different perspective. So it's so helpful to know that there's other folks that they have to go to as well. And a lot of our students, what we, we, we know too, that a lot of our students are working and going to school full time. And so it can be really difficult to connect with the student and, you know, sit down and have a meeting with them when they're very, very busy. 
Um, I see one of the questions here is, um, am I understanding correctly that going forward for incentive grant awarding, we no longer need to check to ensure unmet need within student budget? That's um, not exactly correct. So um, if the student is having an emergency, then that emergency, then incentive grant or student support funds um, can be used to help address the student's emergency. What I recommend is that you work very closely again with your financial aid office so that they can help you make that determination um, as to whether or not it counts as um, part of their unmet need or if it can be um, if if it can be just in addition to the to the funds that they're receiving. I um, can, oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I just ahead. wanted to jump in on that as well, just because I'm the one that brought it up. But um, we typically, whenever there's an emergency aid type situation, we have to document on their cost of attendance budget. And it's basically like a budget offset, if that's what we determine. And so it's sort of just like a budget builder at that point. It doesn't have to, um, you know, the student doesn't have to have remaining need at that point. I'm, I'm also looking for the link to um, that information on the financial aid website. Um, I can post that in the chat as soon as I find it. Thank you. Kathy or Priya, did anyone want to talk about, did you want to talk about um, whether or not you're supplementing passport scholarships or how you're navigating the, the cut in awards? Sure. So um, at Spokane Falls Community College, um, I'm very thankful to say that our passport is housed within our workforce transitions and basic needs area of campus. And I feel like it's a really strong um, partnership there to be able to address the, the gap in funding for our passport students because we can have them complete a workforce transition application to see if we can qualify them for some of our um, programming there with DFET or um, OG or Work First. Um, and so I feel like we have a really nice placement of being able to work so closely with our workforce transition partners. And then we just made a physical move on campus to be close to our financial aid partners. Um, again, trying to make it kind of a seamless transition for students and their experience. But I have noticed what a huge reduction in barrier that is that we can place students with any other qualifying programs to get that holistic support that they need. So um, I feel like we are actually doing a, a very good job of um, reducing those gaps and, and making sure that students have what they need. I also just want to double down on the amazing opportunity it is to work with workforce transitions because again it's like if students can qualify for even a dollar of DSHS um, resources then they can get access to additional funding through workforce and so I'm always plugging my passport students all students um, to go and see if they are eligible for any of the grants that um, come through workforce's office. I also just wanted to mention here how important it is to connect with our community partners because of the additional funding and resources that students can get through them. And not just like physical resources, but also personnel resources, because it's only me as the DSS. And so Monday through Friday, well, we know life happens outside of school, right? And so it is so important to me that students, to, to increase students' um, access to uh, building or increasing like their social network, right? Um, access to community partners who they can call on on Saturday when I'm not at work or something like that or after hours or whatever. Um, and so I feel like access to community partnerships and their support is crucial um, in terms of, again, providing that holistic support for these students. That's a really, really valid point. And thank you for bringing that up, Priya. Very good. Okay, um, I think we can move to the next slide. And Carla, thank you for posting. So Carla posted in the chat, if the student support funds are used as an additional grant to supplement the passport award, it has to fit within financial need. If it is for an emergency and 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 it's documented, it does not have to fit within the within the need. Um, and then she says the first example could be a quarterly uh, award. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. 
Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about um, uh, how, how we're spending the campus funding that's sent to the institutions for the support of passport students. Passport students. So um, first of all, Lexi, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you. How are you spending passport student support funds this year that maybe differs from, from, from previous years? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, in terms of our, our services, we really haven't seen a change in that. Um, we have established a service model you know, using evidence-based practices, in, which includes a, a dedicated student success advisor, which is a professional staff member and a peer advisor, um, which is uh, our peer advisors are all students who are eligible for Passport and have been at WC for at least a year. And when I'm explaining our program to students, I describe our peer advisors as like the engine of our program, which I think is really true um, because they have just that insight and that ability to connect with students to build community and um, you know, a lot of times students might feel comfortable asking them a question that they might not want to ask a, a professional staff person. Um, and so that has really been um, a critical piece of success. I appreciated, Kathy, what you were talking about, the physical location, because I think where we're situated um, in our office right next to several other programs that students are also eligible for is so helpful not just for the students to get connected, but for the brain trust that exists there to be able to um, have a question of, well, who's the advisor for this academic major or has anyone run into this transcript issue? And just to be able to go next door and ask someone that question is priceless. Um, and our uh, college affordability programs team in our office is uh, does a very similar service model, but with financial literacy. Um, they also have a, a program called Invest in Coos, which is a savings match program. So if students are able to save $1,000, they actually earn that at 400%, so $4,000 back for educational costs. And the director of that program is just two doors down from my office. So it's so helpful to just be able to um, connect that way. Lexi, can you say it's investing? Invest in Coos. Invest yeah, Lexi, we're all just going to connect with you after this <laughs> to learn more about what to do and what to implement at our various programs. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I will I will get you in touch with the actual experts who, <laughs> who can, yeah, help. Um, yeah, I guess, I, oh, I'm sorry. I will add one more thought about um, with the question, you know, kind of considering how things might change this year. Um, we do tend to see, this kind of jumping back to emergency funding requests, but typically kind of towards the end of the semester is when we see students um, an uptick in those emergency funding requests. So even though our, our services are kind of maintaining the same, um, we're able to provide the same services, I, I am curious to see what November, December, January are going to look like for our students. And I think that's kind of when we'll start to see the full impact of some of the changes that, that have been in place. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, Priya, what are some of the best practices that you'll use to manage funding sustainability in meeting student needs this year? So thank you for that question, Dawn. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am, I still feel brand new to the program. Um, and so I actually want to pass this along to my colleagues here who have, who I would consider P2C vets um, to answer this question and share a little bit more information with our uh, folks in attendance today. Perfect. You know, like I said earlier, we're all learning and growing and, and leaning on each other for knowledge sharing. So I appreciate your transparency with that, Priya. Um, Kathy, did you want to pick up on that question? Sure. So are you uh, are you hoping um, to have like directly related to the the student support funds, or other um, maybe events or things that we're doing that we're going to be utilizing some of those funds for as well? The student support funds, yeah. Yeah. So we again, I. Um, the comment made about where we'll, we'll see where students are going to be at come like November, December area, because I think that we started them out um, well and feeling like we supported them to, for the start of the year. But we know that there are so many emergencies and things that can happen that. Um, but in addition to the direct uh, student supports, one of the um, things that we, that SFCC created last year is we have monthly connection events for our passport students. 
This is a monthly networking time for them to get together, for them to get to know our DSS and our financial aid administrator. It's, a, it's building a relationship there. We usually have a guest speaker that comes in each month that focuses on either financial literacy, we have different topics that we present. So we do um, have a, an event. We offer lunch, students come down. Um, we have about a 90 minute session. So depending on their course schedule, they can stop by at any time and catch part of that. And the other thing that's happening is we're gonna kick off our second annual Eastern Region Passport event that um, Priya helped host at Spokane Community College. And we plan to do that again this year for our second um, annual event. And um, so some of those funds will be utilized for that. We had um, panelists speak last year, student panelists, who some of the um, student support funds went to um, compensate them for sharing their stories and their time at the panel. So th those are all things that are planned for this year as well. And I wanna also call out that, um, you know, Spokane Community College, Spokane Falls, the two of you are working together to, to produce this event. And I believe um, WC was also part of it as well, right? Maybe not. Um, yeah, we all were Eastern, all the Eastern region. Yeah. So and community I, I, partners. Fantastic. And I love, I love that you are all coming together to be able to provide this resource to students. So um, big shout out to all of you for that. Um, and then I'll, I'll pose this final question on, on this one slide to any one of you. So um, anybody jump in and answer. Um, will your program support services change if student needs are not met? And then if so, how are you going to go ahead and, and do that? Well, I think first and foremost, the answer to that is yes. Um, everything is always changing, especially in higher ed, right? And so we have to be proactive to those changes. And we do so through communicating with our students and really developing those relationships with them so that they know that... Um, and they can trust us with what they are sharing with us so that ultimately we can make this program better for them. Um, and so that that's what I would say. But also just to go back to the last question about funding sustainability, I thought about it more and I was like, oh yeah. Um, one thing that I would say about that is it's important to recognize, is there a pattern in the type of emergency requests that are being submitted? Does there need to be more education around uh, financial literacy um, so that we can change the behavior that's driving these requests um, and educate students on that? So that's what I would say um, in terms of that previous question. Fantastic, thank you. Did anybody else wanna answer that final question? Well, I just wanted to say that we have had the opportunity to, to speak with state legislators a couple of times throughout this past academic year. And when we learned about our reduced funding, um, I have been pretty vocal to our leadership um, in sharing what that means for this vulnerable population of students that we work with. And um, our vice president of student affairs has um, brought that to, I think the group that they have is WISC, um, but I know that he um, has paid a close attention to the fact that that funding was reduced so significantly. And um, I think that we wanna be able to work with leadership with our foundation to, again, close any of those funding gaps for this vulnerable group of students who I just, every time I see the, the funding numbers, it is just heartbreaking. And so um, we've been pretty vocal to our leadership about what this means for our students and hopes that that they can help um, cover some of those gaps. Thank you. Oh, and I, I just wanted to do, so um, I see a question from Emily. Will passport funds be available for youth who choose to enroll or start um, beginning winter quarter 24-25? At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and say yes, that's that's the expectation. Um, and I'm gonna put in a shameless plug too. If, the, if um, WASAC currently has a decision package moving forward for um, passport and some agency request legislation. So if this is something that you're interested in maybe testifying on, or if you're wanting to, you know, um, submit some kind of, support for this legislation, let me know and, and we'll help you, um, we'll help you look at the bill, look at the language that we have um, and, and go ahead and, and share your thoughts with the legisl legislature. 
Lexi, did you want to add anything else? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, no, thanks for coming back to me. Yeah, I um, just really appreciate what Kathy was mentioning about kind of voice leadership. And um, I think one of the one of the things that is functioning really well at WSU is our um, campus and our executive director and the Office of Staff and Engagement really look to, se um, to secure additional funding for passport students. So um, they've actually been able to secure $32,000 in direct student aid from the Miela Foundation. Which is really critical, um, and, and they're continuing to actively look for those additional opportunities. And having those folks who um, are aware of the need and really dial into um, you know those things that are super important for students, um, and that the actual dollars that are attached to those additional initiatives is, is super helpful. Um, and yeah, I think the the thing that I keep thinking about, especially. If, um, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but um, you know, looking ahead, I'm sure we've all kind of considered or heard about like the enrollment cliff that's coming, like potential drop off in enrollments in the next few years. But often it seems like um, opportunity can can come disguised as crisis. So hopefully, as we get to you know look at these situations, there might be some some really good moments to advocate for our folks and and especially look at some of the barriers that are in place that um, institutional perspective might be shifting on that in the next couple of years. Um, maybe I'm a little bit naive, but I'm, I'm going to be hopeful. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I just want to jump in um, and say thank you so much, Kathy and Lexi, for what you shared in terms of the onus being on the institution right? They, it's not student equity gaps, it's institutional equity gaps. And how can we collaborate as institutions and organizations to really put our heads together and utilize our collective power to ensure that the onus does not fall back on the students because we know that that's how these systems operate. And so I, you was about to get me going. You was like, don't go down the rabbit hole, but I'm going down it because this is so important to remember um, and to ensure that we are not working as silos. It's so easy to do that. Um, but now we, we, we need to utilize our Washington passport network. Um, so I just want to express gratitude for the, again, the, this webinar happening um, and to just put it out as y'all now have our contact info, I think we'll put in the chat maybe, um, but let's utilize our collective power to ensure that students continue to get served. Thank you, thank you so much for saying that. John, just one other thing to add on that. I will share that when students receive their letter about their reduced funding for this year, I have had three students that have come directly to me to say, Kathy, if there's another time that we have a voice to share with our state legislators, please, please. Um, so I, they are well aware of what this and how this is impacting them and their success as students. And they, they want to share their voice. Yeah, I was really surprised. So each summer we send out a student survey. And um, this year we added a question to the student survey about whether or not they'd wanna share their, their experience with Passport with a legislator. And I was really surprised with the number of students that said yes. Um, and I'm I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled by that. And I think it's such a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to um, really let them be heard and let them, you know, share. Um, and so we're doing some work um, to make sure that they do have an opportunity to be able to to use their voice and share their experiences. Um, and, and, you know, again, if any of you are working with students and, and you're hearing what Kathy is hearing, please, you know, put the student in contact with me so that I can make sure that they have the information that they need to be able to move forward in that work. Um, and Juliet also just posted that she is a registered lobbyist. And um, so she uh, is working to, to be able to, um, to help these students share their, their voices. I love that. We're gonna go ahead and transition to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about some supplemental um, opportunities for uh, some opportunities for supplemental funding. And you know, I know Priya has already talked about reaching out to community resources and looking for other ways. Lexi, you were talking about um, the work that you were doing. And um, I know things are tight right now. I know things are, are kind of difficult. So I'm, I'm just curious to know, are there other funding op options on your campus or within your organization that your programs could utilize? 
Um, Angie, do you feel comfortable jumping off with this one? Sure. Um, we do. We're fortunate to have um, quite a few funding options to assist students if they're experiencing emergency situations. Um, we have a, a grant that we apply for each year that's specific just for emergency aid. Um, and that's uh, typically around 65, 70,000 that we get per year. And so that is huge in um, being able to support these students. Um, I know other departments on campus also have emergency funding. I know the Champions Program and OMAD have emergency funding for students. Um, we also have different um, types of funding um, situations through the housing and food um, department on campus. And so it's really just pulling yourself out of your, um, I think Priya mentioned um, your silo and finding out what is available on campus um, and off campus, um, definitely with food pantries or housing assistance. Um, there's so many things that are out there. And I think working on emergency aid has really kind of opened my eyes to that. Um, and so I just would like to echo that, you know, um, having those relationships with campus partners is just going to help the student that much more. Um, sometimes it's so overwhelming for students to, um, you know, be in this emergency situation and then also trying to go to school and pay for their bills and, you know, do all the things and they don't really know where to start and it can just be overwhelming. So if, if everybody kind of has at least a starting knowledge of who to go and speak to if you know there's students experiencing something you know it's it's just going to help the students so much so um, i think for me for financial aid i do hear from a lot of these campus partners um, because i tend to be the one um, that manages the scholarships for our office and so um, i a lot of people contact me, which is great. I love it. Um, I also have a pretty good working relationship with um, most of our students as well. Perfect. Lexi, Priya, or Kathy, did you wanna? So again, I just wanna share that we thankfully um, were able to hire our basic needs navigator in January of 2024. Uh, they are also housed within our workforce transitions and basic needs area, obviously. And this has been really critical for the relationships that Priya just talked about in community too. We just developed a community and campus resource guide um, with bringing on our new navigator and um, really getting creative and working with, v with our Volunteers of America partners, others for funding sources that we can um, augment with what they're receiving at SFCC or cover any of those gaps. So with everybody housed in the same area, I feel like we've got a pretty good rhythm of being able to support students. Um, we did just get uh, an, the SEAG um, planning grant this year. Um, Spokane Falls Community College was not a part of the initial um, awards that came out. It predates me, but I think about by six years ago. And this is the first time we've had the opportunity to submit and apply for the SEAG funds in addition to our SSEH funds. And so we're on a planning grant uh, phase for that. So next year we will have some additional emergency student supports to help. Perfect. Um, are you able to access other funding, either foundation or private grants through your organization or through your networks? And I know that we're, we're getting close on time. so. Um, yeah. Yeah, it looks like we got about five minutes left before our QA. Okay. Or are there other opportunities to partner um, in support services? So this is like Kathy was just talking about um, uh, SSEH. Are, are you, I know many campuses have SSEH funding or other types of funding. Are you partnering with them on a regular basis in the work that you're providing? Uh, support that you're providing to students. I'll jump in on this real quick. Um, we we also have a similar um, request form for SSEH funding, and then um, that it's the same form for for that and for uh, Crimson Community Grants, which is more of educational cost based funding. Um, but yeah, there's so many. It, it, it's such an interesting setup being 
on the polling campus and in a rural area um, because there are quite a few uh, resources that we, that we can partner with. Um, but then also to highlight, we actually serve students system-wide. So we we collaborate with basic students navigators on Vancouver, Vancouver campus, Tri-Cities, um, and uh, each one of those contexts is so different and unique. Um, so it's super helpful to, to tap into the, the folks who really have the lay of the land in those places as well. Perfect. I think we can move to the next slide. And this this slide is basically, I mean, we've already touched on a lot of this, but we were um, we we're wondering about other student support strategies and specifically in uh, supporting students' financial wellness and navigating the passport budget shortfall. So I know, Lexi, you were sharing about the, um, the program that you have. Priya and Kathy, I was wondering if you had any um, programs like this about, you know, uh, helping helping uh, students uh, with their financial wellness and and what are what are you finding to be successful in in this work? Absolutely, um, I will just plug again community partnerships and increasing my capacity um, because I do have you know other roles and things um, on campus um, and so I it was such a great opportunity to partner with SNAP last year which is the Spokane Neighborhood Action Partners um, and we brought them on campus to do a finan financial literacy um, workshop it was a two series workshop just sharing with students about how to budget um, what is the difference, like what's a credit score, what's the difference between a, a personal loan and student loan, car loan, like all those different things, right, the, the life skills, um, and I don't know about y'all, but I definitely didn't learn that in high school or college, um, and we know that those are yeah, we know that those are really important topics for our students, for everybody. Um, and so that was a great uh, partnership that I definitely want to implement again this year because education is key. And again, that's how we are proactive rather than reactive. And so I think that that was something that truly was successful last year. Um, but also, I want to say just having transparent conversations like, hey, I have student loans too, right? But how can you learn from my experience and be better than me, <laughs> right? Be smarter. Um, and so I would say communication. And I think what I would add is, again, we just try and be creative with trying to figure out how we can get this information to students as Priya was mentioning. One of the things that we are starting this year is we want to support our passport students who are looking for student employment opportunities on campus. So we found a, a need this past year when we were finding secure housing for students. Um, to be quite frank with you, I was going after hours and volunteering my time to move some of the students into their new housing. And I shared with my dean and he said, you know, Kathy, you really need to think of a creative way um, to address those needs. And so what we're doing is starting like a basic needs brigade of student employees who are coming together who can be dispatched to kind of help out on these moves when students are receiving um, uh, secure housing and they you know come together as a passport network to, to do that work. And then they're earning a paycheck to go along with it. So if they qualify for state or federal work study or institutional um, funding, we are looking to really have them be part of the campus community in their work environment too. And they are supporting their their you know peers in the in the getting new housing and um, so we we are working with that. The other thing that we did this past year is we brought DSHS to campus, um, their mobile unit. Uh, we just had them here last week. There were so many students coming to receive their services that they're coming back um, Friday because they could not serve all of the students that were there to see if they could get on basic food or other resources with the state. So. Um, the other piece is we have workshops in our career education and partnerships area where we offer that financial literacy. Financial literacy, we work with STCU, Canopy, um, New America Credit Union, and they are the ones that are coming and delivering that financial literacy. So we're just we're inviting them to those monthly passport events, um, and we're offering them in in different spaces across campus to try and get that information out. Truly amazing work. All right. I Lexi, did you want to add anything or Angie? 
Um, I can just add a, a little bit about what we do on our campus. Um, I know that our designated support staff works closely and they may have other resources for helping students with their financial literacy. Um, through our office, we do have a website that's dedicated just to money management. Um, it covers a lot of the topics that everybody else was also talking about, um, but we, we have budget sheets that students can download. Um, we work with students directly with these budget sheets so they can kind of have that as a guide guide um, and you know we we also just work with them on a regular basis and all students on a regular basis to talk about financial literacy and um, you know making sure that you're on a budget uh, for the academic year yeah I did um happy to interject to you about that um we set that up mobile uh, DSHS services uh, because that's a, a thing that we do at each workshop, but we have a hard time getting our students pulled back, which is 15 miles away to go to meet with someone um, regarding that. So expect me on our And Kathy, I did I did wanted to just I, um to just throw in there that your 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 student support brigade, I I, I can't remember what you, exactly you called it, but you could use passport funds to help cover their their expenses. So if you're doing this and, and they're getting a paycheck, you're helping our passport students move or whatever it is, um, you can use some of those passport student support funds to help cover those costs um, for that, that that work. I'm glad you said that, Dawn, because that's what we were going to, we were hoping that you yep. were going to say. <laughs> absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And I do want to, I, I, I mean, many of you have already been doing this work, but I just wanted to put it out there too, that if you're um, wanting to do something on campus to support your passport students and you might maybe need some support or if you need to talk through what you're doing and um, if you have questions about whether or not it can be you uh, passport student support funds can be used for those um, projects or expenses or whatever it is send me an email and I'm happy to talk through it with you I'm happy to provide you with some feedback or um, you know and, and give you some of that Maybe if I, I say, yes, this is an approved expense, maybe it'll help you get through some of the bureaucracy that's on your college campus. So I'm always, you can always use me for that um, and I'm happy to do it. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back to Ozzy. Um, for our panelists, thank you so much. Um, uh, we welcome your questions. Yeah, thanks, Don. I know you guys have been doing a great job answering questions throughout the presentation. Um, but if anyone else has any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the chat now, and we'll go ahead and get to those. So I see a question here. Um, it sounds like perhaps, especially on the bigger campuses, it's up to um, you all to figure out where the resources are. Um, how do you, how do the students know? And do you find when they talk to the DSS or financial aid lead, they are supplied with all of the various resources? Great question. I can jump in. Um... I know for our campus, um, the UW Seattle campus, we um, really rely heavily on the partnerships that we have. So if it's um, me who's hearing about a student who is having an emergency situation and they're also a passport student, my first, my first message is to our designated support staff because we work as a team really to, to figure out what the student needs and where they, you know, would best be served um, and yeah I, I just there's a, so many different ways we have tried to centralize it a little bit more at our campus since it's so big we have an actual emergency aid portal um, where the, any student can actually go and submit their request and kind of give us a little bit of information about what's going on and then we also have a dedicated team of of either counselors or managers that reach out to those students just to get a little bit more information and kind of talk through um, their resources on campus so we've tried to make it a little bit easier for students 
it can be, I think, overwhelming for a lot of students, especially when they're in crisis. I also just want to share um, in terms of like centralization of communicating with the students is that I implemented a Canvas shell where I uh, add any student who is eligible for the Passport program to, they get to accept or decline um, the invitation, but that's where what I utilize in order, or that's what I utilize when I'm sharing, hey, there's extra money, here's this resource that you should use um, so that I know I'm reaching out to every student, whether I know they need it or not. Um, and that way they can access it at a time that's best for them. And like it's documented, you know, just all of those things. Um, I have a hard stop at 2 p.m. And so I just want to um, poke Kathy to talk about the uh, resource guide, Password to Careers resource guide that we were chatting about earlier. Um, so in terms of printed materials to share with students. Was that a question? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think that, that I think that communicating is is key. We thankfully are just um, are using our CRM to do some texting to students. So we trialed that at the last couple quarters or the last couple months of spring quarter, um, especially to advertise like our monthly events and. Um, kind of gathering and any additional resources we want to share. So we use our CRM, our texting capabilities, much like Priya does. I will tell you that we have um, we have a very small campus and our passport students are in our office frequently and we know them pretty darn well. So um, thankfully we have the CRM to help, but we, we do want to come up with some more ways that we can get the word out, especially when we're sharing in the community and at tabling events. Um, and then we did develop our community and campus resource guide this past year in partnership with our, our basic needs navigator. So it was just kind of a ramble. Well, and one of the things that we know that so many, you know, we're, we were trying to eliminate barriers for student enrollment into Passport. And so we've, um, we've taken uh, a lot of the applications out of, out of Passport. And so you know, many students, they arrive on campus, they're awarded passport, but they're not necessarily aware of what that means. And so I love the idea of the brochure that you're doing, Kathy. And I believe you're going to send us an electronic version so that we can share it in our in our shared um, files with, with the passport designated support staff. So I encourage campuses to think about things like that um, and helping students become aware of what resources are available to them as a passport student. Um, and then I see Emily has a question here about um, private universities and resources, um, uh, and what's available to them. So again, you know, uh, institutions like Seattle University, they have um, they have uh, significant support for their passport students, um, their their foster youth students um, specifically. And you know, we can uh, Possibly, Emily, we can uh, we can share some of the um, resources that private institutions have. Crystal Cardona was supposed to be with us today, and she was one of the representatives from a private institution. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it. Um, but yeah, we can we can gather some of that information and maybe share it out. Crystal's with St. Martin's, Don. That's correct. Yeah. All right, Aislinn, I think our, our time is coming to an end, but go ahead, Ozzy, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to say, I think we're at time. So I was just going to thank everyone for, for joining us today. I know it's been a busy couple of weeks for everyone. And big thank you to uh, Don and our panelists um, for sharing a lot of great information and perspective from their different roles and campuses. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at passport at collegesuccessfoundation.org. I'll go ahead and drop it in the chat too. Um, and then keep an eye out for an email from the Washington Passport Network regarding upcoming webinars, as well as a post-webinar survey. Um, and I definitely encourage you all to visit our website at washingtonpassportnetwork.org um, to check out our resources and um you know, that's where we'll put a recording of this webinar and you'll also be able to find recordings of past webinars as well. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us and I hope everyone has a good rest of your day.